first half of April 1942. After a demanding and exhausting three-month battle, close to 80,000 American and Filipino soldiers are taken prisoner by the Japanese and forced to set out on what will gain infamy as the Bataan Death March. This is War Against Humanity, a sub-series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. In the second half of March 1942, we saw how the extermination camp of Bevchech is now operational and how a second camp, Sobibor, begins construction. Jews are now being deported from France and Slovakia to the camps at Auschwitz. We also saw how the British commenced their strategic bombing campaigns against German civilian houses, targeting large cities like Essen and almost fully destroying the smaller port city of Lübeck. Setting off fury within the German leadership that their population now faces what they condemned so many others to until now. Now they plot for revenge. They call it the Bedecker Blitz after the widely popular tourist guides published by Karl Bedecker. See, the British raid on Lübeck and the subsequent firestorm destroyed a sizable part of the historic medieval city center of Lübeck. To dissuade the RAF from doing something like that again, the Luftwaffe plans to answer in kind over famous British cities with a cultural value like York, Bath, and Canterbury. For now, those plans remain plans, though, and they continue their already ongoing strategic bombing campaigns in places like the island of Gozo and Malta in the Mediterranean. Malta and its capital, Valletta, is especially important as a strategic position for supplying the North African Front, a potential base to launch invasions in Italy, and a sortie point for Allied bombing raids, or as Churchill puts it, his unsinkable aircraft carrier. From the viewpoint of the Axis, Malta has to be dealt with. The Axis powers are in the early stages of planning an amphibious invasion of Malta named Operation Hercules. But until then, the island shall be pounded into weakness and the population demoralized to the point of surrender. On March 20th, 1942, the German attacks increase aggressively. In March, 275 air raids are carried out. In April, 283 raids, good for 9,599 sorties. In the six weeks between the middle of March and late April 1942, the Germans dropped 6,557 tons of bombs on Malta, half of which are on the capital of Valletta. By comparison, roughly 260 tons of bombs were dropped on Coventry during the entire Blitz. After Malta is pounded for 154 consecutive days and nights, smiling Albert Kesselring, commanding the operations, will report that there is nothing left to destroy. This siege's collateral damage is the thousands of Maltese inhabitants who now go without enough food, clothing, medicine, and fresh water. A large part of Malta's vital infrastructure roads, sewers, electricity, hospitals, factories, and wells is damaged or fully destroyed. Thousands of houses are demolished or rendered uninhabitable. Disease spreads like wildfire among the weakened population. This is if they aren't already one of the hundreds who die in any of the many raids. On April 15th, British King George VI writes to the Maltese governor. To honor her brave people, I award the George Cross to the island fortress of Malta to bear witness to a heroism and devotion that will long be famous in history. Commander of Malta, Lieutenant General Sir William Dobby answers, by God's help, Malta will not weaken, but will endure until victory is won. Once again, a bombing campaign has succeeded at nothing meaningful other than killing civilians and being little more than a nuisance to military operations. Once again, the population has come out broken, apathetic, sick, and dying. But no one has surrendered. No ground has been won. But that is not going to stop any of the belligerents from trying and trying again. After the fall of the Burmese capital Rangoon, the city of Mandalay has become the center of Allied military operations. It's now for the Japanese to attack that military by killing civilians directly and indirectly. 
In the early hours of April 3, 1942, Japanese bombers carpet the city with bombs, destroying almost all infrastructure and launching a devastating firestorm, which leaves about 60% of the many old wooden houses in ashes, rendering most of Mandalay's 150,000 inhabitants homeless. A few days after the bombing, Claire Booth Luce, a reporter for Life magazine, reports. Here and there lay a charred and blackened form swaddled in bloody rags, all its human lineaments grotesquely foreshortened by that terrible etcher, fire. Every house was burned down or still flaming and smoldering. A terrible stink arose from 2,000 bodies in the ruins of brick, plaster, and twisted tin roofing. Only the smoke-grimed stone temple elephants on the scarred path were watching guard of the road to Mandalay, where buzzards and carrion crows wheeled overhead. Bodies were lying on the streets and bobbing like rotten apples in the quiet green moat around the untouched fort. Among the victims are thousands of Burmese, Indian, and European civilians and soldiers that sought refuge in Mandalay after Rangoon fell. While Mandalay smolders, another 50,000 refugees arrive, desperate for food, medical attention, and a place to rest, only to find that they will have to continue their escape north, now joined by many refugees from Mandalay itself. They depart in the direction of Kiao Pao Dang, hoping to cross the Irrawaddy River to reach Shwebo and Kata to proceed their journey north to India. Ahead of them lays a treacherous and uncertain journey to safety. But it is not as hopeless as that of tens of thousands further east. On April 9th, Bataan falls to the Japanese after 90 days of bitter fighting. More than 76,000 American and Filipino soldiers surrender and are taken into custody. It is the single largest military defeat in American history. The Japanese now have to get them to San Fernando, from which they'll be taken north to Camp O'Donnell, a former military base that is repurposed by the Japanese as a POW camp. A journey of roughly 106 kilometers, or 66 miles, that they will have to make on foot. Many are wounded, sick, and exhausted from the months of intense battle. To the Japanese, the amount of surrendered men is incomprehensible. A Japanese sergeant asks himself in disbelief, how could they give up with this many soldiers? The thousands of prisoners are gathered and disarmed at various points around the peninsula, and on the 10th, the march begins. The prisoners are herded in columns of about 200 guarded by Japanese soldiers. The distance traveled a day differs from 10 kilometers to 30 kilometers, sometimes more. In total, it will take most between five and seven days to complete the journey. And so the men carry on. Day after day, they walk in the blistering sun. Water and food is scarce. The guards not only refuse their prisoners' sustenance, but often punish them for attempting to get some from civilians or drink from the wells and villages they pass. Survivor Eugen Boyd recalls, As the days passed, the lack of water became a serious problem. A person can go a relatively long time without food, but in that tropical climate, your body deteriorates rapidly without water. The weather was punishingly hot, and we were forced to walk mile after arduous mile with no refreshment. If you have ever played a strenuous sport on a blistering summer day, you know how thirsty you get. Imagine that feeling multiplied tenfold, and you'll understand the crazed thirst the men on the Bataan death march endured. Early that evening, an American ahead of me was driven mad by his painful thirst. He jumped out of the column, screaming wildly and begging for water. I hated to watch, knowing how the scene would end. As the insane POW ran toward the Japanese sentry, the guard shot him. It was the only time during the march that I saw one of our boys killed with a bullet. At least he died instantly. I know I would rather have been shot than bayoneted. That slower, more painful death is what many more will suffer. Japanese soldiers drive by in trucks and cars or wait for new victims at the checkpoints. They swing their bamboo sticks and clubs randomly from their vehicles. Often they use the butts of their rifles to bash their straggling adversaries or take a swing with their whips and swords. To torment their enemies, some Japanese group up and force prisoners to run the gauntlet, which few survive. Those who fall behind due to exhaustion or their injuries are stabbed to death with bayonets or swords. 
Those who break formation to get some water from a well can expect a bullet in the back of the head. At other times, prisoners are simply slaughtered without any apparent reason. There are even reports of Japanese soldiers launching contests to see who can kill the most prisoners. Some Japanese soldiers frown on the behavior of their comrades, silently apologizing for their fellow soldiers' behavior or show some humanity to the prisoners. But in general, the march is characterized by brutality for the sake of brutality. There is no clemency, no shred of humanity. The majority of Japanese soldiers have only contempt for their enemy, who they see as inferior, spoiled, and weak. How many die in the march itself is still unclear, but it's 500 to 650 American and at least 5,000, perhaps even 20,000 Filipino that end up as rotting corpses on the wayside or buried in shallow graves hastily dug by their fellow comrades. The thousands who survived the Bataan death march ultimately make it to Camp O'Donnell, where their struggles are far from over. Here, they will face the same level of indifference and cruelty for many, many months to come, if they survive. Their march has been much like this war. Every step, suffering. Every minute, desperation. And every hour, death. The final destination awaits not salvation, but yet another level of inferno. Horrors inflicted in blow by blow by enemies with no respect for your life, simply because you are different. In their eyes, you have no humanity. You're already dead. Never forget. Ooh.